Okay, hi. Um, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, webinar panel and digital launch for Becoming Our Future Global Indigenous Curatorial Practice, edited by Dr. Julie Nagam, Carly Lane, and Megam Tamati Quenel. My name is Irene Bindi, and I am production editor for ARP Books, the book publisher that just released Becoming Our Future. I first want to acknowledge that I and some of us here are on Treaty One territory, home of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree Dakota, and Dene peoples, and homeland of Metis Nation. I also want to crucially acknowledge the struggles going on right now, here and now in our city and around the world uh, with Black Lives Matter, struggles for Black lives, for Indigenous lives, queer lives, disabled lives, BIPOC lives, and to state that it's a privilege to be involved with a press whose role is that of an amplifier, supporting and existing in solidarity with numerous communities and working for the amplification of often complex and challenging and mobilizing ideas. So we are a small press based here in Winnipeg, as I said, on Treaty One, we focus on progressive politics and social justice, as well as cultural and literary works and work that lies in the intersection of those things, which means we were very excited upon our first meeting with Dr. Julie Negum uh, to hear about this Tri-Nation collection, Becoming Our Future. Uh, which Julie will discuss at more length, but which I want to, to emphasize that Julie had a very clear creative vision for that she um, sort of mapped out for us from the beginning and has led the book and the unique structure of the book, which I think is fantastic, and the collaborative spirit behind the project through to fruition. And here is the beautiful result. Um, so I just wanted to welcome you all. Thank you um, to those of you who are participating in the panel and those who are attending um, the webinar and to uh, welcome Julie and the panelists, all of you. Um, and uh, Julie will introduce the panelists after I introduce her. So uh, Dr. Julie Negam is a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Arts Collaboration and Digital Media and the former Research Chair of Indigenous Arts of North America, which was a joint position with the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Dr. Negam is an Associate Professor in the Department of Art History at the University of Winnipeg. She's the inaugural Artistic Director 2020-2021 for Nuit Blanche Toronto. Uh, the largest public exhibition in North America. Dr. Negam's Shirk research includes digital marker spaces and incubators, mentorship, digital media and design, international collaborations, and place-based knowledge. She's a collective member of GLAM, which works on curatorial activism, Indigenous methodologies, public art, digital technologies, and engagement with place. As a scholar and artist, she's interested in revealing ontology of land, which contains memory, knowledge, and living histories. Dr. Negam's scholarship, curatorial, and artistic practice have been featured nationally and internationally. She's building an Indigenous Research Center of Collaborative and Digital Media Labs in Winnipeg. So with that, I will turn it over to Julie Negam. Thanks, Irene. I just want to say, Chima uh, Gwich Marcy, Thank you um, to ARP Press. You guys have been an incredible team to work with. And um, not only could you deliver a beautiful book in collaboration and uh, let me be a little bit, uh, how do I say, uh, bossy. And so uh, in a good way, it was an awesome collaboration to get to work with you guys. And the team is small and nimble. And um, your distribution and your contributions to Winnipeg and nationally and now internationally are really renowned. And so we're really proud and happy to be part of uh, your guys' uh, book collection now. I also want to say a uh, shout out and a thank you to the Canada Council for the Arts, Creative New Zealand and Australian Arts Council. Um, it's their funding and opportunity that brought us together originally in 2015. And they also contributed greatly to the project in terms of uh, curatorial and, sorry, not curatorial writer fees and um, copyright fees for our artists. And, um, it's just really important in terms of getting that support, and especially uh, in our current climate, it becomes even more imperative that we start to do that work. Um, I wanna welcome everybody to our uh, Indigenous Global 
conversation. For some of us, the sun is almost setting and for others, the sun is just rising. And so it's pretty exciting to kind of think about those cross cultural and kind of um, kinships that we're building across hemispheres and oceans. And so this book is uh, one of the first of its kind. Um, some of it grew out of the Tri-Nations Exchange and some of it has grown out of the fact that we've been working, collaborating for as long as people have been migrating across the vast ocean. And I think that it's important to kind of think that um, we're not just um, at the start, we're actually very far into a long history of connecting and working together in different capacities across Indigenous nations. And so um, with this book, uh, we are bringing together um, Turtle Island, Atoroa, Australia, and Hawaii, but I don't see Josh here today, so, but he's in spirit in the, in the book. And so um, we were really excited to kind of include and make sure that that Pacific conversation was uh, part of this dialogue. We also have Jolene who occupies a unique position that's inter, inter border across Turtle Island. And so, you know, the other kind of struggles that we have, not only do we see with the American uh, politics and that entire collapse of that nation, um, they just have not been able to contribute the same way that the councils, the Tri-Nations councils have been able to contribute. And I think that's important to recognize that not only is the U.S. going through its current climate, but it also continues to underfund and not provide opportunities to Indigenous artists and BIPOC artists more broadly in the United States. And there are no key funding bodies for them. And so therefore, we're not able to kind of enter into those kind of agreements. Um, I really, on a basic level, I'm excited just mostly because we've created family and friendships and um, just to get the opportunity to get to see everybody is also fun. We have a great group of people who are all incredible in their own right and have an excellent practice, um, a good spirit of generosity and just a, an exciting energy to be around. And so I was hopeful that everybody would just say hi and do a quick introduction of themselves. Um, you know, just your name and title, whatever you want, and so that we can get moving into the questions. So, Nikki, if you want to start, because you're to my right. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone, and thank thank you all. It's really lovely to you know to see all of the, the familiar faces, but also to see some new faces. And I look forward to having more to do with you all in the future. Um, so, I work at the Art Gallery of South Australia. I'm the curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art. Um, so we're here on Ghana country. Um, my family are Barkindji people from the far west of New South Wales. And as well as being a curator, I'm also artistic director of the Tanandi Festival of Contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art that we hold every year here at the gallery. Um, and I also am an artist, I'm a photographic artist. So thanks for having me here. Um, to Nikki's right as you wanna, if you'd like to go. My name's Ioana Gordon-Smith. Um, I'm a curator based in Porirua and I work as curator Māori Pacific at Pātaka Ada Museum. Um, so I work with Ruben Friend, who's the director there. Uh, I am Samoan on my mum's side from Neo Va'a and Whaleula and English on my dad's side. Uh, but I grew up in Porirua um, and it's really fantastic to be able to work here now. Um, and also, yeah, fantastic to meet uh, some new people on the Zoom and looking forward to the chat. Long legs, Dorita Grey Eyes, you want to go? <laughs> I'm saying you want to go, Maginak, Dorita Grey Eyes, and Sun. My name is Dorita Grey Eyes. I'm currently in my home territory of Treaty 6 territory in Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, I'm a member of the Indigenous Advisory of the Winnipeg Art Gallery and a co collaborator, a conspirator um, with my fellow um, rock stars, Heather Guliarte, Julie Nagam, and Jamie Isaac. It's a pleasure to see you all and to connect with you this way. Um, Jolene, would you like to go? Yes, uh, Tri Askanaha, I'm uh, with you this evening. Uh, what is evening here in the East Coast? I'm um, in my own uh, nation territory, which is Tuscarora. And um, I'm really pleased to be part of this project. I serve as an associate professor at Cornell University in the History of Art and Visual Studies Department. I have a, a joint appointment in the Art Department. And I also have affiliations in 
the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program and American Studies. Uh, I began as an artist. I became an art historian. I now consider myself a visual historian. And along the way, I've curated uh, uh, exhibitions and uh, the most, uh, Probably the most notable was I was one of the in inaugural curators for the National Museum of the American Indians uh, opening, uh, which was part of the Smithsonian. And I curated along with Paul Chet Smith and Gabby Tayak, uh, two of the four inaugural exhibits. Um, thank you, Nyawa. Carly, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Carly Lane. I am an Aboriginal woman from Queensland, which is on the east coast of, of Australia. But I live in Western Australia in Perth on Noongar country, Wajak Noongar country to be exact. I'm the curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art at the Art Gallery of WA. And mm, I know, I like curating. <laughs> <laughs> Lately, would you like to add? Uh, Talifa Lava, I'm a Samoan, Persian, Chinese, and European uh, artist, curator, researcher, essayist, and currently a guest in uh, Yumuvu country in the far north of Australia. Um, normally a postdoctoral fellow at Concordia University in Jojake, Muniang, Montreal. Nice to be here with everyone. Kathy, would you like to go? Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Kathy Mattis. I'm a freelance curator and writer about art and I teach in Ishkabatons Wasa Genapateg, otherwise known as the Department of Visual and Aboriginal Art at Brandon University. Our uh, department was started by artists, by Indigenous artists, um, initially in the 70s and uh, We've been going strong, uh, thankfully, and uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm also a PhD candidate in the Department of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. I am two weeks late on handing in my, <laughs> my first draft, but uh, this has been helping me. I have all sorts of tags and uh, <laughs> I'm really glad that I uh, received this in the mail and I'm so grateful to be here and to, to get to participate in chat this evening. Mark um, My uh, co-conspirator there, Heather, you got sure. a few <laughs> Yeah, there's... I'm uh, trying to pretend like there's not a dog dr dropping a ball at my feet and <laughs> scratching my leg. <laughs> I'm uh, Unasaka Tungatskitsi, uh, Dr. Heather Gluliapilunga. Uh, good evening, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm Heather Gluliordi. I'm, uh, I'm from Nanatsiavut, I'm an Inuk, but I am currently living in Muniang, Jojage, Montreal. And I'm at Concordia University, where I hold the University Research Chair in Circumpolar Indigenous Arts and direct the seven year Shirk Partnership Grant in Inuit Futures and Arts Leadership. Lisa. Um, I'm Lisa Myers. I am an independent curator and an uh, artist, and I'm an uh, assistant, assistant um, professor at um, York University here in Toronto. Well, I'm not in Toronto, actually. I'm a couple hours north of Toronto, but in Toronto, um, in the Faculty of Environmental Studies, where I teach um, a, food, a course called Food, Land, and Culture, and I also teach art and um, so I'm really happy to be here and uh, a real honor to be part of this group and to be included in this, this book. So I say miigwech to you, um, Julie, for, and everyone that made it possible. So. Nigel. Good everyone. Um, my name is Nigel Burrell, curator Māori art here at the Auckland Art Gallery Toyo Tamaki in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, my tribal affiliations are Ngāi Te Rangi, Ngā Te Rangi Nui, um, to Whakatua here, and their, their tribes all of the North Island of New Zealand. Um, and yeah, it's great to be here and it's great to see familiar faces and to connect with you all. Kia ora. Freya. Hey everyone, it's 
really nice to be joining you all this morning. Here it is. Um, I'm a Nugi woman belonging to Kwandamuka country. Um, so Minjiraba, North Stradbroke Island and Mulgumpin, Morton Island. And I'm a curator, arts worker, writer, just wearing many hats. And um, I work quite independently, but I have been working um, with the Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane for the um, past years, um, working on a number of projects. And this morning I'm on Yagura land and Chirubal land. And it's, yeah, the sun's just rising over here. Well, it's been up for a few hours. <laughs> Ruben, would you like to introduce yourself? Sorry, who? Me? Ruben, sorry. <laughs> Ruben, I, was, I, can, I can hear you, you said. I know, you're muted. Hey, Dana. Kia ora koutou, uh, Ruben, friend, director at Pātaka Art Gallery and Museum in Porirua in New Zealand. Um, thanks, for, uh, Joanna, for giving us a shout out earlier. Um, I have been trying to curate less so that my curators can do their jobs because uh, we've got some awesome curators here. Um, we're one of the few galleries that have a strong mandate uh, to promote Indigenous art from the South Pacific um, and that kind of spreads out across the uh, Pacific Rim, um, across Moana. So, um, hi everyone. Um, my background is um, European New Zealand Pākehā on my father's side in Ngāti Maniapoto o Tainui, uh, which is um, widely regarded as the best uh, Indigenous iwi uh, in New Zealand. Kia ora koutou. <laughs> That's not true, but okay. You know, partly I just did, got everybody together just so I could have some laughs and uh, hear everybody back. <laughs> back then. So, you know, Kimberly, you want to say hi? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Kimberly Moulton. I'm a Yorta Yorta woman. Uh, my people are from the southeast of Australia. Um, I live and work on Wurundjeri country in Melbourne or Nam and Biranga. Um, I'm a curator and a writer and currently senior curator for Southeastern Aboriginal Collections at Museums Victoria. Uh, Jamie, I can't see you, but I know that you're there. So, uh, Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself? There you go. There's your face. Hey, everyone. I'm super um, happy to be here tonight with all of you. and. Um, Julie for putting together this amazing book. I actually just saw it today and I was so thrilled and um, yeah, very excited to be part of this project and to be with all of you tonight. Um, Jamie Isaac, uh, Anishinaabe Akwe from uh, Saging First Nation, Ojibwe, first signatory of Treaty One territory. And I come from the Bear Clan, um, Fierce matriarchal side, um, and uh, my dad's side, patriarchal side, European, British. Um, I'm a curator of contemporary indigenous arts, the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and also a freelance curator and interdisciplinary artist. Well, Miss Warren, do you want to say hi? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Tanse, hello. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, I am from the Montana band, and we've gone back to our indigenous name, so we are now calling ourselves the Yakimic Cree Nation from Alberta. Um, just a little above Red Deer, if anybody knows where Red Deer is. Um, yeah, and I'm uh, talking to you from a hotel because <laughs> I'm escaping COVID and trying to uh, just ride it out. <laughs> um, and the thing is, is that it's so amazing to see all of you. Oh my God. So we're coming back from Australia because we all had to run home and try not to uh, catch the pandemic on the flights home, uh, but it was really good to see you guys when uh, whoever was there in Australia. And, um, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Love you guys. Okay. Love it. Decolonial love and kinship, so we can maybe start there. Um, uh, <laughs> is there anybody secretly hiding in another black box that I don't see? Did I get everybody? 
All right. So um, we're really excited to have everybody and just, just what we said, we're excited to see each other too. And so we're gonna try to have kind of a lively uh, dialogue that will be somewhat intellectually stimulating, but also probably with some inter, uh, inter uh, tri nation jokes. So um, definitely we're excited to see you guys and um, it's very different to run a panel virtually. It's also hard to kind of imagine an indigenous circle and a way of being in these kind of like really kind of square boxes that we have to kind of live in for the next little while. I know that um, for us uh, in Manitoba, we're experiencing almost a COVID free situation and New Zealand just announced that they are in fact a COVID free if you never let anybody fly in or fly out ever again. So uh, we'll see what, <laughs> we'll see what happens if you guys are on lockdown forever. Um, so I kind of want to start one of the first questions with uh, in our current climate or in a post COVID world, how will Indigenous international collaborations exchanges happen? How do we kind of imagine them? And I thought we would kind of start with the Winnipeg Art Gallery, um, the Indigenous tri, tri nation sorry, triannual. And um, so if we want to call on uh, Kimberly, Ioana, Ruben, and Jamie uh, to kind of start that dialogue off of thinking about how are you having to kind of rethink and reconfigure the exhibition that you're working on um, for Winnipeg here for now, 2021? Well, I think we're still trying to figure that out, to be honest. I mean, um, we're all kind of, I think, landing on our feet in terms of um, rescheduling the triennial, which was really started, uh, was going to be September 2020. Um, and at this time, we're really still trying to come together as, as a group. Um, I know just with the Winnipeg Art Gallery, uh, there's been cancellations, um, postponements, and um, we're still meeting and really wanting to um, connect as a group, but also I'm thinking, you know, if there are uh, travel restrictions, um, what kinds of materials and um, forms will uh, we bring into the exhibition that um, can still bring about Tri Nations conversations around water and water sovereignty and um, the themes that we wanted to bring about in the original uh, exhibition. Um, so just in terms of uh, having a group kind of discussion where we're keeping that going and um, and that's all I can say, really say from, from my end of things. Does um, Kimberly and Ruben or Iona want to yeah. add to that? Yeah, um, I'm yeah, I've sort of been the... thinking in yeah. You oh, go. This is my internet. Thing. Sorry. Um, yeah, I've just been thinking around sort of like the tangibility of, of objects and we had discussed bringing in, you know, existing collections from our institutions, but also working with um, contemporary artists. And so how that might shift in a, in a space now where we we may not physically be able to travel there. We also may not be able to travel our objects and um, also how, you know, how we, particularly in my situation where a lot of the objects are, are sort of 19th century um, historical objects as well. You know, is it, is it right to remove those objects from country um, and take them overseas uh, even now, but especially now, um, in such a sort of fragile state that the world is in. So yeah, thinking about how we use technology to experience um, experience an object or experience kind of the tangible, in an intangible way, um, which has been done and it's, it's kind of not a new concept, but I'm trying to kind of work my head around that, yeah, for the show. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, um some obvious like logistical repercussions around like freighting and travel and so forth. Uh, but I think for me, I'm probably uh, focusing or more interested in what COVID has meant for the way in which the four of us are able to connect. Um, because obviously a particular, well, the, the show's obviously been delayed. So we have a bit more time to kind of connect together and have conversations and, and work through some of the conceptual underpinnings and some of the artist selections and so forth. 
Um, but I'm also mindful that um, each of us individually are working out what COVID has meant for our workloads. Um, so in some ways we have more capacity, in some ways we have other things that we now need to consider. Um, so I think we're all just trying to work out each other's rhythms and, and the ways in which we're able to converse online. Do you have anything else to add to that rhythm? Yeah, so for us, it's been really interesting. We have several international projects going on, so we're really excited about the um, triennial and the conversations around water and water sovereignty. Uh, but we're also working on projects with uh, Dr. Julie Nagam in Toronto and um, Ioana is curating the Venice Biennale for New Zealand with um, Yuki oh. Kihara. I'm working on a project in Taiwan, looking at the influence of indigenous art on modernism. Um, um, and so we've got all these international projects on the go and there's a lot of uptake on digital uh, media and interaction. Uh, but one of the things that it's made us really think about is if we start to pull back on travel and we start to uh, reprioritize some of our international budget on local artists and investing on uh, a few more commissions and ways that we can really support local artists, then we may see in the next few years through COVID uh, a significant investment in local artists, which might be a really good thing. It's gonna happen across our country at least, and I imagine other countries will be doing the same thing. Whether they want to or not, people are going to be forced to, to localize and prioritize locally. Um, and I, I think that's actually a really interesting opportunity. And I think that might actually see some really good outcomes for investing in local artists. Heather, do you want to expand a little bit on among all these tundras and add some points there? Yeah, this is actually, uh, I was just thinking this is a great place for me to jump in because uh, I'm working with Juana and Ruben on an exhibition that I co-curated with two graduate students, Carissa Von Haringa and Amy Prouty. And that show's already, it's been touring across Canada for the last two years. And uh, it was supposed to start open up Pataka in December. Now it'll be pushed back a little bit, but we're still trying to figure out a way to make it happen, even uh, while respecting things like, the, first of all, the travel ban, but also, uh, you know, the, the uh, cost of the environment that, it, that shipping an exhibition from one side of the world to the other side. <laughs> we had already kind of thought about making it travel light because we were concerned about, um, actually originally we were concerned about seal skin. So <laughs> we didn't want to have um, ivory, walrus ivory and other materials that would get flagged at the border because that can really hang up an exhibition and that's just around, um, you know, uh, long-standing things that happen around uh, shipping animal materials overseas. So it already is, has a lot of video and photography in it, but there are a number of objects as well. There's artworks in the show. And so when Ruben reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and asked me to kind of think through how we could uh, engage with that, we actually had, and I'm really inspired to hear what you're talking about, Kimberly, because we had some, I've been talking with my curatorial team and we've been saying like, you know, for example, I, I wish I could show it on the screen, but look it up later. There is a, um, there's a comatic in the show made by uh, Kuzin Ben Hublin, and it is made out of uh, shipping crates materials, like the, um, what are those called, uh, pallets. And so I was thinking, you know, was, uh, like, could we be inspired by artists like Saul Lewitt, who um, send conceptual art uh, and then have it made in other places? You know, like, could we think through how to create materiality by having not necessarily, I wouldn't call them an artist collaboration, but having makers uh, create works based on instructions so that, you know, another work in the show is UR Nango's uh, Sami Shelter series, which is sweaters. And, you know, New Zealand has, uh, you know, is like responsible for the huge wool industry. <laughs> and so we were thinking about, you know, those, uh, those sweaters are Sami Shelter's day. And he actually, um, we talked about it, but we didn't include it in the show, but he has at previous times included the instructions so that people could knit their own Sami shelter sweaters. And so that would be a really interesting project that you could send it without having to actually physically mail it. You could involve community in it. You could employ local artists um, in the execution of work. So I'm, we haven't fully figured out how everything will happen. And of course that doesn't apply to everything. I can't have, you can't have artists carving, you know, Kablusiak's stone butt plug or <laughs> like Listerine bottle or what have you but you can't but I think that there are some interesting ways so like right now we're trying to deal with how do you how do you take an existing exhibition and transport it but I'm excited about the future when you can design an exhibition 
entirely around thinking about sharing uh, conceptual frames of knowledge without having to uh, ship things physically. It's, it's interesting. Um, Carly, do you want to add, and then right after Carly, I want um, Freya and Leuli to talk a little bit about their exhibition uh, transits and returns and how different that could have been in terms of because a lot of it was about gathering and not just gathering for the curators, but gathering for the artists as well. And so how that would have shifted based on the current climate we're in. And Carly, you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say, this, obviously, we're now in new terrain when it comes to COVID-19 that we've got to rethink our traditional experiences of what uh, curating and the cu exhibition experience is for uh, both curators, artists and visitors alike. But I don't think we have to know all the answers at the moment because I think uh, as artists continue to demonstrate that they are always thinking of new ways of doing things. Mm. So I think that we will, um, it, it will be organic, you know, different minds will come together and suddenly we'll have these amazing uh, new curatorial exhibitions. That's a great point. Leili and Freya, which one do you guys want to go first? I can go first. You want to go? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, it's a really good question, Gillian. It's something um, I've been reflecting on a lot about how lucky we were to travel so much over the past um, 24 months. Um, so we transit and return started from the commute exhibition at the Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane in September 2018. And then we had the layover at Auckland Art Space in March 20, 2019, and then resulting in transit and returns in um, September in um, last year. And um, so much about our three-stage iteration was creating space and um, platform for sharing and connection. And um, I, I'm not sure how it would have looked without that um, that opportunity to to come together so much. Um, uh, but I have been thinking a lot about the strength of our relationships and um, how we like how we're all here today um, sharing with each other how um, there was actually yeah, a lot of strength in the actual forming of relationships and um, what other ways we could have explored this on um, free communication and sharing and, and keeping up to date. Um, but yeah, I'm just really grateful that we, we did have that opportunity over the past two years to, to physically connect to, together and um, visit each other's lands and communities and um, have that time together. Leoli might have something to add. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to also say that like one of our uh, other three collaborators as curators is uh, watching. So shout out to Tara Hogue um, and also Sarah Biscardelli and Lana Lopesi. So I think to have such a, you know, when we started, people were like, well, you have eight artists in the first show and five curators. That's a bit off. And we're like, no, no, this is entirely by design to really center the needs of artists. And we you know, did that throughout the three projects. And I think that because we really emphasized local or like more region-based artist curator pairings, um, that that would have still continued and that uh, in, you know, in this kind of climate, we would still be working closely, meeting up, socially distanced, or uh, the vast majority of our um, uh, connection and building relationships was by Skype. Um, and Facebook, you know, uh, video calls. So that would have still continued. And I think, I think if we had also pushed it back by a year, um, the institutions would have been happy. And uh, I think the having something on the horizon to look forward to, like the Triennial in Winnipeg and other such projects, I think is also really important for our, our collective mental health to kind of get through these kind of trying times. But I really feel that there was always a really strong. Um, uh, link between artists and curators who ha are more familiar with the artist practice and their art histories and which are who are more region based and then kind of taking this leap together through the internet to connect and sometimes are able to travel together and sometimes not so so there's a tension and a balance Heather you wanted to add something 
Yeah, I was gonna, I was getting excited when you were talking about that lately because that's, uh, a, a, someone else who's watching it, our co-curator, uh, Carla Taunton is in the collective with Julie and I, um, Glam Collective, which is for anyone, I'm sure everyone watching knows, but that's galleries, libraries, archives, museums. And uh, we also have a very high curator to artist <laughs> ratio because we do a lot of our programming by doing intensive incubators first and then showing the work sometimes just in like one night art festival kind of thing. So it's like a really intensive environment where we often, we also have like technicians that we bring in. And the other thing that we always do is we um, bring on a one or two emerging indigenous curators to work with us so that they're also receiving that training hands-on instead of just, you know, learning it in classroom, but actually getting to participate, but having the support network of multiple other curators as well. And we found, um, you know, mentorship is something that's super, super important to, I know everyone on this call. And uh, I think that, <laughs> like, I think that the more that we can do that work now, the, the bigger the critical mass that we build, the, the less we'll all have to do uh, you know, when we're ready to retire. <laughs> so I'm ready to like inspire a new generation and, and to really bring them up with us so that they uh, benefit from that same experience. So we try to like, it's not one to one, but it's it can be like one to two <laughs> kind of ratio of curators to artists. And I agree, it, it, it does really work. It's, it's not really, excessive. <laughs> and it's very guerrilla style, right? So I think that that's the important part to mention that it's intensive. We're trying to mentor new generations of curators. You know, we're also working in kind of a very public space. So most times it's it's usually quite, you know, it's not um, gallery, um, the same sign up, same sort of intensity in terms of having a full team of a gallery and having a fixed place that you know and can adjust to the environment. You know, sometimes it rains, sometimes it snows, sometimes, you know. So there's lots of different aspects to it. Um, <laughs> the other thing I want... Permits on the fly. <laughs> yeah, permits on the fly, exactly. It's guerrilla style. The, um, the other thing I was going to say is, and I think that's important to note for the book, it's like, it's a starting point. And there were lots of people that were involved in different curatorial and international exchanges through the different countries that we're talking about. And there's a long history of doing that, you know, just even through the councils. But the fact is, is that they are contributing and doing incredible projects all on their own. And you don't get to necessarily see them, but their voices impact the work that we're doing and vice versa. And the fact that we have, you know, um, footprints to follow from people who have been leading in this area for long periods of time. So I think that that's important to know. Um, and I was gonna move on to the second question if we we're okay, I, I didn't see any hands or sudden gestures. So um, uh, it's kind of a basic question, um, you know, how do indigenous international collaborations benefit the arts and cultures more broadly? And that can be, you know, this is an open question for everybody. It could be something that benefits you personally. It could be about mentorship and the next generation. It could be about how it shifted your institution and forced your board of directors to think more broadly. You know, it's, there's lots of kind of outputs in terms of how international collaboration uh, benefits people. So I don't know who wants to start. I'm not uh, talking to the <laughs> Hi. Uh, who, who else said something? Sorry. I just wanted to quickly add to the last, the, the conversation, because I think it's, um, if I could, uh, that we all work within, I think, as, as curators and artists and um, as a delegation of curators together, as the curatorial teams and amazing collectives that we all sort of belong to. Um, but I think, you know, a lot in looking through this book and knowing some of your um, curatorial practices um, and artistic practices, that um, community is a huge part of, of that. And so I do wonder about the impact of, of community um, because just in thinking and knowing some of how you work with your, your curatorial practices is thinking about community content or impact and impact within the gallery and um, I, I just wonder about the impact of COVID um, and also thinking about galleries that are were so forced to go on a digital platform um, that maybe weren't necessarily ready for it 
um, or prepared technology wise for it. So I, I'm just curious, you know, to see how this will actually affect the future of curatorial practice when so much of what we do is community oriented and how we think of impacting community. Um, so I know that's a much larger conversation, but um, I'm really thinking through that and um, particularly uh, the Border X exhibition that I've worked on was, was canceled or, or postponed and now we're thinking about new ways of bringing in um, community within these gallery spaces and having the opening and um, having that, you know, how is that going to affect uh, the, larger, the larger communities that are engaging in these exhibitions and feeling empowered by having the community in these kinds of spaces. So I think, um, you know, I'm mourning uh, the loss of the connection with community in these spaces, but I think, you know, the silver lining is, is that there, with the triennial coming up, we do get more time together in terms of really thinking through this exhibition. Um, so silver linings, mourning, um, and thinking of new ways that we can be more like resonant and relevant in a, in a digital world outside the actual gallery space and how those spaces can still be decolonized and indigenized. Dana, you wanna add? I think I just got a, a, a vibration on my text message. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's a ton of sirens that go by here, so that's why I have my uh, mic off. I don't wanna like inundate you with the police going by all the time. Well, it sounds like Winnipeg, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's downtown living. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, I should have probably added to the last little bit of the questions there, but um, yeah, COVID's really hit us hard, but um, I mean, overall, I've just uh, tried to push back all the programming. I haven't canceled shows uh, or taken down any of the salaries, and I forgot to introduce that I am the director of Urban Shaman Gallery and Arts Run Center here in Winnipeg, um, but also, um, which I think would be really great if at some point we bring Amber Dawn Barrow in at some point because she has been so integral to helping us get a satellite space in um, Santa Fe. Unfortunately, we had to cancel that programming because um, going to the U.S. is not a great idea right now, but I do love U.S. Um, and I miss Santa Fe so much, but um, yeah, like it's so amazing that we have uh, now a secondary space down there. And I think the impact of that is that we've been trying to program to some very um, big events, which is Indian Art Market, uh, which is very kind of commercially based, um, I guess artisan, I don't know. I hate using all those like terms to kind of set boundaries around art, but a lot of jewelry makers and all that. And so um, the last show we did was with uh, one of Kent Monkman's, uh, one of his older pieces, um, Dance and Mischief. And we brought Laura Ortman in. And like, it's a very wealthy, kind of very white um, town, um, but they appreciate the arts. And uh, after Laura, I don't know if everybody knows who Laura Ortman is, but she is a, an amazing musician and she totally like, she givers when she performs. And so, um, two older, <laughs> two older white ladies came up to me and said, "This is exactly the type of programming we need in this town." And I was just flabbergasted that these two old biddies really enjoyed what we did. And so, I think that's really the impact that we can have as curators, as artists, going to spaces, and yeah. So, that's my two cents. Can I can I add another one thing? We did a project, sure, and hi Dana, we did a project with uh, Dana at Urban Shaman uh, some years ago where we took a whole bunch of Māori artists uh, and their digital artworks um, and the show was called uh, Indigenous Aotearoa and uh, one of the artists, Kiriama Taipa, who does a lot of uh, virtual reality um, and 3D printing and those kinds of things. I was speaking to him yesterday and he said that for years he had been trying to get traction for digital Māori art practice in New Zealand 
and uh, he'd have to go to these places to install these artworks. But the kind of the irony is, is that the whole idea is that he doesn't have to go to these places to install these artworks and he can bring these experiences. We can 3D scan objects and people can virtually interact with museum objects and uh, cultural items uh, all around the world. Um, and that COVID, by kind of forcing everyone to stay home, has forced everyone to really engage with um, digital practice. And I, I wanted to come back to something that Heather mentioned earlier with, um, with uh, among all these tundras, the, the project that we're working on her with. Um, one of the questions that we put to Heather was, if we're doing an indigenous art exhibition that is um, about culture, but it's also about the environment, um, and alongside among these tundras was an exhibition by a Maori artist, Warren Maxwell, and a New Zealand photographer, um, Jason O'Hara, who have gone to Antarctica, and they're recreating Antarctica. So it's this exhibition that kind of brings the Arctic and the Antarctic together for this conversation about um, indigenous knowledge related to these very fragile parts of the planet. But us actually traveling across the planet and having these relationships um, in person as great as they are, contribute to the very thing that we're kind of talking about. Um, and COVID has been a really good way to, to get us to have this. I mean, I don't think we'd be even having a Zoom international webinar like this if it wasn't for COVID and all of a sudden um, this way of working, but also with the Black Lives Matter movement in the States, there's been space because everyone stopped moving for a second that we can really engage and share and, and learn. And I think there's been some really good outcomes for um, BIPOC uh, communities and artists um, out of this project. So that's my, that's my one scene to know. I just got to say, Julie's, Julie's project is called The Space Between Us. And so I've been joking that the space between us should be two meters. <laughs> 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 oh yeah it takes on a lot of different meetings now that's for sure oh, yeah it's true jolene you wanted to speak oh you're on mute yeah. your, your mic <laughs> i think working um across indigenous communities around the world is really important also for the broader decolonial project and it also, I think, really brings out uh, the kind of energy and uh, like Leanne Simpson, Simpson and others like Jeff Korntassel have used this notion of resurgence. It brings out this idea that uh, as indigenous peoples, our communities are moving into the future. And I think that the comparative curatorial projects have an enormous amount uh, to contribute in terms of making that space. I mean, up until this point, I would argue that one of the only international or global spaces for Indigenous peoples to gather was through the United Nations. And, you know, that place has been a really kind of unfriendly place for the arts. And so I think the, the kinds of collaboration that um, this group and others have been working on uh, makes an enormous difference in defining um, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, there is a particular settler state relationship that's being negotiated through all of these spaces, that, uh, that there's new ideas of community and nationhood that are um, learned from each other by working, you know, across these, you know, um, nation state borders. And so I think it, you know, it's a really critical moment. And it's, you know, it's, I think we were lucky enough, many of us were lucky enough to be able to travel. And I really see the early 1990s as that moment where we began to really move into each other's communities. And if we hadn't been able to do that, I'm not sure that at this moment we would be able to really respond the way we can through a digital space. Because I do think that, 
you know, the, you know, this will be a moment when we're going to have to work in this kind of remote virtual condition, but we're going to need to still, um, I think, physically engage in each other's spaces to, to move the discussion forward. I think that's super important. Kathy, you want to go and I just want to link that back to what Jamie said earlier around community. And I think that, you know, as we kind of prepare from even from a university perspective, and I'm sure that's in the context within museums and galleries as well, but that experience that that actual um, embodied practice that happens when you inhabit somebody's physical space and meet their community, uh, whether that be on land, on ocean, on, you know, some kind of floating thing, it's just, it, you can't replace that. And so I think that that's gonna be an interesting tension. And I think just what saying, building on what Jolene's saying is that, you know, that, that's a critical kind of pivotal moment where we're able to actually meet and connect in person and get to learn from each other that way. And that's through community practice, right? And embodied indigenous and cultural knowledge. Mm -hmm. So Kathy, you wanna go? Just in response as well to some of what Jamie said, um, uh, for myself, I, as a curator, I've certainly uh, had some projects postponed along with everyone else. And it feels a bit like an incubation time for my curatorial development, however. Uh, and I curate for and with communities. And one thing I've personally been doing is watching videos that Métis people have been putting online of themselves uh, teaching how to bead or telling stories or sharing language, uh, musical performances. And just as a curator who's driven by community and, and uh, my people and my culture, it's really, um, it's kind of helping to fill the void a little bit right now um, that the exhibitions uh, that I'm having the privilege to co-curate have been uh, postponed. So I'm just trying to really, if we think about and we name community as a priority, uh, presently there's an opportunity to see how the community is operating in regards to cultural continuance and continuum during COVID. Um, and so I'm really hoping to learn and take from that. And then also thinking about the mentioning of mentorship and international collaboration and exchange. Uh, when I was at the beginning of my curatorial practice uh, in 2002, I was fortunate enough to be an instigator and co-curator uh, and collaborator for an international collaborative exchange between Urban Shaman Gallery and Bumali in Sydney, Australia. And it really changed the course of what my priorities were as an art curator. Uh, I think at that time, and I was quite young, I was thinking about curating as putting the pieces of a puzzle together. Um, and I think that experience changed uh, where dialogue and thinking about generous reciprocity, um, that exchange really impacted me. I'm thinking along those terms, uh, because when you remove yourself from your, your homeland or your territory and have opportunities to communicate with other Indigenous people uh, from other lands and name who you are. Um, you know, I don't, you know, if Julian and I are sitting, we don't talk about who the Métis people are. I don't, we don't have to explain or Heather or, you know, people uh, in North America necessarily, but the opportunity to be able to really self-reflect and name your family, your kinship, what's important to you, that really solidified for me what my goals were going to be and, and shifted where I was going with curating. And, you know, when we got off the airplane, the artist who I got to travel with to Australia for that project, um, the first thing the, the artist who picked us up said, um, we don't like the title of the project you've come up with. Uh, this is an exchange. Uh, we don't want to do any of the programming you think need to happen. Just let us host you. And for two weeks, it was going out for coffee, hanging out with them on the land, going for walks in the bush, visiting their, their families. And for me, being young, um, a young emerging curator, that really was foundational. That's, that to me was the core of curatorial practice. So I think it's important that there's these opportunities to bring in emerging curators in international collaboration. Merci. For sure, and I think that that's why the dialogue with you and Dana and the dialogue with Leili and Josh and uh, Ioana and Kimberly is so important because it kind of maps 
where we're thinking about, you know, we're talking about all these projects that we've done and the kind of historical context within the book, but at the same time, what's the future look like? You know, what's, what, what are we going to talk about? What is it, you know, what, how does it actually transpire? How are we going to shift ground differently five years from now or 10 years from now or hundred years from now? Um, I wanted to go into the second question unless anybody wanted to add, um, and, and it's specific in terms of how do we as Indigenous people shift the institutional colonial structures? And so um, I was hopeful that maybe Jolene and Heather, you guys want to talk a little bit about the university context in terms of how that is a challenge, because <laughs> the structure isn't as obvious. And then I was also um, thinking that uh, Jarita and Jamie and Heather could talk a little bit about some of the work at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And then maybe um, moving to our Indigenous directors to talk a little bit about their institutional change happening within the director level. And then we'll move over to all of you folks in Australia to talk about some of your institutional challenges within your, within your varied, you know, a lot of you are kind of situated in a national space, but also to in a regional space, so. Hi, I, I don't, I don't see Heather at the moment, so I'll, I'll pick it up, the thread. Um, because I work at an institution in the United States, um, I think that, uh, that I, and also I would consider myself uh, working across multiple indigenous communities as well as um, really trying to familiarize myself with the relationship between indigenous communities and uh, different settler states uh, globally. And so what's interesting is that I think that there's a very different um, uh, critique and in, an informed critique, critique going on in Canada uh, that um, will impact in indigenous studies, in particular um, indigenous art that will have a broad impact uh, globally. I see less movement at present in the United States in the academy, but I think I've, I've recently um, participated in a number of Black Lives Matter events. And I think that because there isn't, uh, because this moment is about um, this kind of you know, recognition of institutional racism that, uh, that uh, we may see a, a tiny window of opening to actually renegotiate that space within the intellectual apparatus of the institution. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't think anybody would be surprised that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. And the, the fact that this curatorial group can, can exist, I think is really um, uh, one of the things that, you know, this, uh, that is, you know, so critical at this moment because we've spent hundreds of years of people speaking for us. Yeah. And I think this group now really represents a kind of turning point that, you know, uh, we have our own intellectual um, contributors, uh, we go back to, you know, we understand a methodology of basing things within our worldviews or uh, cosmologies. Uh, and so things will have to change within the critique in order to effectively uh, engage our work. And so I think it's, it'll be a good measure at this point to see um, how these other events may impact uh, what's happening. Yeah, Oh, sorry, but, uh, sorry, but I would just sort of add to um, what Dr. Ricker was saying. I, you know, I think we have a, an opportunity, certainly, but I also worry that the first sort of wave of COVID was sort of these early cancellations um, of exhibits, of connection, of time. But what I worry is because we don't have, um, you know, I think the critical mass within the levels of the institution in which power and is influenced in terms of you know the budgets, the hiring, um, the board of directors. If you don't have that those those people in place in those roles, that the next wave of the impacts of COVID 
will hit when, when budgets are cut, when the decisions about you know, who to let go or who to bring on, when resources become scarcer and scarcer, as the true economic impact of COVID hits in terms of philanthropy and donations and global government budgets, I think there is where, you know, I think there's a lot of concern, but also, again, opportunity. But if you have organizations that have had that deep commitment to engaging with Indigenous ways of acting in terms of taking care of ourselves and our communities, that those institutions, I think, will be in a better place to make sure that you can move forward in times of scarcity and precarity in a, in a good way. Um, I was going to ask if Lisa wanted to add, I saw Jamie has her hand up. So Jamie, you want to go and then maybe Lisa, you wanted to add anything from the York perspective, because you're in a unique position in terms of you have a community driven artistic program within a larger institution that is very colonial. Yeah. Well, I was just, I was um, just a, actually just agreeing with some, th some of the things that you're, that uh, Jolene was, was saying and thinking about um, this moment in terms of um, uh, addressing systemic racism in, and I, I guess I'm not, I'm, you know, there's all this, all, all these things, all these institutions, different institutions that I'm connected with right now. And some of them are, you know, kind of a public gallery that's scrambling to figure out whether they are going to put together a statement um, in support of Black Lives Matter and in support of um, taking action. Um, and then also in my, the faculty I'm in, you know, it's a moment that I see everybody um, getting together to, to put together collective letters to, to, to try to make change. The change that we've been talking about for a long time um, and trying to make that happen, this seems like a real flashpoint. And I think that's what, um, that's how what I understood you were uh, mentioning, Jolene, that this is a point where um, it's a way you can leverage the moment to make change. And I think that's really difficult. I mean, I think a hiring, hiring um, is, a, is, a, is an act that can do that, but also pushing for this idea that we need to shift things, not to make a place for people to, um, to come in and be set up for uh, more success than to just have a really rough time when they do come into an institution. Um, so that's sort of what I was um, chiming in on or like giving a uh, sort of vocal uh, yes uh, to what Jolene was saying. And, and, um, and I think I'm really interested in, in um, thinking and working with artists who are, um, you know, um, facing, facing that. And I think that the work that we're doing as Indigenous curators is helping um, navigate through these institutions together with artists and I think these I love these teams of um, curators who are who maybe outnumber the artists but I it is it is a it's a feat to sometimes navigate through these things and, um, and navigate when you're also accountable to your own community and things like that too so I, I, I that's sort of what I wanted to say and I, I didn't say much about York but yeah it's a big corporation so so and it, it puts together these academic plans which are very hmm, I don't know I don't know it's a bewildering so um, hopefully the next academic plan, plan will have uh, some more concrete action so that's what I'll say right now I think it's really good to acknowledge today that um, you know we're seeing across the US that statues that glorify <laughs> white supremacy and colonialism are being taken down by the people mm. Um, and I think that's like really important to acknowledge that people are demanding, uh, aren't demanding the change. They're just going out and removing these really harmful public pieces of art. Um, and that's an important thing to acknowledge that's happening in the world right now. Props to whoever created the tweet of the Columbus statue discovering the river. <laughs> that's <Hold> funny. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I, I also, like, I just want to really quickly acknowledge, like, how much privilege it is for us to be able to travel to each other's countries. And I know that you were saying how important that is and how how we can't replace that. But there's not not everybody can do that. So in some ways, um, um, us not being able to do that for a while and not, you know, kind of being in our at home or wherever we are and not being able to travel and be with people it's 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 not uncommon for most people not to be able to do that so i feel like there's a kind of such a privilege that we've been able to experience that 
that um, that I think things can still happen, you know, uh, with without even if we have to be apart for for this time. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that, um, but I don't think I didn't want to. Um, Carly's going now. <laughs> Jamie wanted to oh, uh, jump in, and then Carly, Jamie, still want to. Sure, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, um, well, Jolene, Lisa, <laughs> um, the last three commentators, just about um, in, the, in the last few weeks, like uh, institutions um, really thinking self-critically or those kind of motivators or social agents within the institutions to provoke self-criticism on an institutional level. Um, but also like to take that responsibility um, to think about optical allyship in Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter. Um, and I think that the, these sort of ideas of co-option of um, ideas of decolonization and, and indigenization and to actually um, have people working within these systems to be supported, to be able to um, enact decolonial and indigenization methodologies. And so I, I think there is a constant kind of criticism um, from community that larger institutions are, um, you know, presenting ideas about optical allyship, but not actually um, enforcing that in the everyday practices or the, you know, ideas of bringing um, artists into the collection um, or being able to support artists and the community in a larger way, other than saying we're in support of this. Um, and I was really interested in those kind of conversations because, um, you know, it really brings out, uh, you know, an activation of um, decolonization, which is basically, you know, like realizing the white supremacy history of museums and gallery systems, academies, and what we're going to do to go forward. And so um, I'm really, um, I think I'm fatigued by some of the, con like some of the conversations that happened um, last week and in being, you know, of course, of myself being super supportive, but in the same way, um, wanting to uh, have a conversation with the institution and knowing that there are um, really amazing allies there, but how do we do this in a good way? How do we actually hold space in a genuine, sincere way? Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, you know, Black Lives Matter, Indigenous, Indigenous Lives Matter, and, um, how do we do this so we're not just doing this for the optical of us um, engaging? And um, I think, you know, it, it, it was really transformational and having so many people involved in these conversations and so many really great people at the, at the gallery to be involved um, and to actually have that self-criticism of the gallery, of the institution and of that history. Um, and so, yeah, I just think, I know Julie, you wanted me to respond. So um, I think going back to really thinking about decolonizing and indigenizing these spaces, um, I, I wanna think about like the, the values. And so like resonance, respect, reciprocity, to give and take relationships, um, to challenge, you know, the biases, the whole history of white supremacy within these gallery spaces. Um, and then also I would add to address the changes or the charges of anti-intellectualism when it comes to centering indigenous knowledge. And so um, having elders voices in these spaces, um, having indigenous um, community uh, voices within these spaces as being anti-intellectual is also something that I'm um, putting forth out there in terms of centering indigenous knowledges within these like larger institutional spaces. Um, so I just went off. 
Okay, well, Carly, if you want to go and then maybe we can get the directors to say something, but Nigel and Nikki, you guys have not spoken. So we're kind of, we got about 16, 17 minutes. So I want to just make sure that everybody gets a chance to, to speak. And so, um, yeah, Carly, you want to go? I, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, we work in pressurized zones in, in terms that uh, our, our institutions are silos and we operate in silos as, you know, for example, Nikki and I and Kimberly are, are one, two, three uh, uh, and alone in our institution. So we really do need our allies inside the galleries, museums, universities, as well as our allies outside. Carl, you want to chip in because you just got to join us. So do you want to? Unmute yourself and. Hi, everybody. Can you oh. hear me? Yeah. Um, well, just, just responding to the, the general question about, uh, I guess, decolonizing our institutions. Um, so, I guess for us, with, particularly with the pandemic, um, the, the main focus has been on ref, kind of re-looking at what we do in a much more focused way because we're not now looking out into the world so much. And uh, just talking to uh, Lisa's comment before about, you know, it's lovely to be together in this kind of global context across Zoom, but now that we can't travel so much and uh, there's been all this talk about, you know, being armies falling over and big events falling over, um, that it is a really great opportunity for us to re-examine our local context. So um, I'm quite excited about that, and we've been doing a lot of that with our programming, which has been really great. Uh, but I think uh, Ruben's kind of been developing something a lot more methodological, so I think it's kind of will be interesting to hear from him about that. Go ahead. <laughs> Do you want to go? Yeah, I spoke about that um, a bit earlier in the in the conference. I think you might have missed that bit, Carl. But we've been um, finding ways that we can engage online and create not just awareness about the way that Indigenous art and artists address the state of the world, um, address art, but we can also create. Uh, curatorial modes or practice and ways of working that respond to them as well so we're more conscious about our environmental footprint um, if the artists are talking about climate change and curators need to respond to that with our behaviors um, we can create better uh, support locally of our local artists as well by focusing a lot of our funding um, to our local communities um, I think it's even more important now with people being afraid of budgets and a potential global recession uh, to focus what you can locally, um, support your, you know, your domestic market, invest um, in, your, in your community, but also still try to engage um, internationally as smart and responsibly as we can. I just wanted to jump back in. Um, that, uh, I think just following on from that, that um, for us, a big focus has been on programming and making sure, because uh, a few people have talked about, you know, things falling out of programs in institutions um, and uh, potentially the sort of ongoing impact of a recession and all the rest of that. So for us, it's been really important to keep the focus on uh, particularly Māori and Indigenous programming in our programs. If things were going to fall out, it wouldn't be those things. And actually, uh, I was talking to Nigel about uh, 2021, which is where a lot of our 2020 program has been pushed out to. And 2021 in Aotearoa is looking pretty exciting from an Indigenous perspective because all of our programming is falling in that year, which has been amazing. So I think um, in that sense, it's been a really great impact and it's about kind of keeping that rolling and, and um, not losing the momentum of the 
environment and their sense. The only question is, you know, you guys will have some great programming for 2021. Is it just going to be localized viewers? That might be the big, the big question on everybody's mind. It's like, if you continue to just stay on lockdown, you know, there might not, you know, and that's fine. I think it's a, just an interesting shift and, and forcing institutions and all of you guys running your institutions, you already do a good localized focus on serving your communities. There's lots of um, colonial or white dominated uh, museums and galleries here in North America that don't do a good job of that. And I think that they're going to be forced in a different way, you know, especially when we look at major cities like New York or Toronto or Vancouver, um, they're going to be forced to think about um, not, not operating through tourism. And so that's going to be a different way of shifting and looking of who's coming in and where those dollars are coming from. But I, I do really want Nigel and Nikki to get a couple of words in here. So Nigel, yeah. Yeah, sure. I think um, it's been interesting hearing everyone's uh, take on the COVID situation because for me, I really enjoyed it. It's been a real reset time and it's been a time to just take stock. I think, um, you know, um, uh, it's uh, we Indigenous people are inherently resilient. So this is nothing new, you know. COVID's just a, a blimp in, in, <laughs> in humanity's... Um, takeaway basket and I just think you know it's it's a chance to really just just to slow down um, and it wasn't till at the Sydney Biennial realizing as the programs changed day by day with people coming and going what was actually taking place and uh, I suppose it all kicked in when we all got home and for me um, in our institution it's been an opportunity like Carl said to to reset the program and to refocus. So the locals become quite integral to to our thinking for the next year and a half. Um, we'll all be we'll all be collaborating again um, in a range of ways, you know, uh, before we know it. I think I think we live in a, a time now where our immediacy of creating projects can sometimes dictate um, the pace in which we do it. And this has just been a chance to take stock and to to think about it differently and I welcome it. Um, I suppose, you know, also just hearing what you said, um, Julie, you know, that has also meant different things for different peoples and different cultures and different cities. So that has other implications. For us it's been it's there's a positive window there to to re to rethink through um, yeah, what we want to do aspiration wise. And like anything, it's it's also to do with the institution's uh, desire to see that aspiration as well. So for us, it's meant um, the large contemporary Māori art show that we're working on has been given more um, precedence and footprint. So it's been it's been a good th it's been a good thing for us. Um, and um, I can I can appreciate that you know it's 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 had different effects. For, for all of our communities and our cultures and our countries. So um, it's been interesting, but I think, you know, we continually are um, collaborating and, and networking and scheming. And I don't think the scheming stopped. It's just, we've just taken different modes and, and taken the opportunity to, um, to do what uh, Jolene's talked about. And, you know, there's a window here. So we've, we've seized the window to, to, to reconfigure what we might want to get out of that. And to me, that's sort of exciting. Um, you know, it's a precarious age, but at the same time, there are still opportunities that we can seize within that. So yeah, mixed feelings about the whole situation. Nikki? Thanks, thanks everyone. It's been so interesting just being able to listen and, and you know, to hear what you're all saying. Um, here in Adelaide in South Australia, we've been really lucky. And, um, you know, I think that as far as our communities go, uh, so far so good. Um, I'm working towards Tarnandi for this year. So we're not sure what that's going to look like, um, but the exhibition itself, I'm working with 10 different um, artists and artist groups. So we're just going ahead as if, we will have an exhibition, we will have a publication, 
Um, so, you know, all of the texts and thanks to Freya has written a terrific text to go um, to go in into the catalogue as well as um, a few other people the texts have come in from. So, so it's been, you know, something that the artists have been able to focus on and to have, you know, an opportunity for something, you know, for October this year. So people have been really positive, you know, all of the artists that I've been liaising with are just, you know, really happy to have something to work towards. Uh, as far as the Tarnandi Art Fair goes, of course, that's, you know, a huge marketplace. You have, you know, lots of people. Well, the artists themselves won't be able to travel down to Adelaide for that. But we're looking at other ways. And so we've just been this week touching base with the artists and the art centres that would normally come down for that and just seeing what do they need? You know, what, what is it that they, that they want? And everyone so far has just been really happy to talk to us and, just to share with us in the first instance, you know, what this has meant, what COVID-19 means, you know, for them and their communities. And they're really appreciative of being able to, to have a conversation in regard to what, what could possibly happen and how we can help support them to make that happen. Um, there's the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair, which will go um, prior to us in August. And so we've had some catch up meetings with them just to talk about what are they doing. So across the board, we're just trying to liaise in a way that helps um, the artist to be able to achieve some of the sales that, that they would normally have had through, through these art fairs and these opportunities. Um, I think it's really terrific that we're able to at least work towards, you know, a publication so that, you know, for the Tanandi um, exhibition itself, so that there is something, there's an outcome. Um, and the exhibition itself, of course, the launch, you know, that's going to take on a whole new, um, a whole new way of being. Um, and I guess, you know, we'll be able to use the, you know, the digital platform to be able to share that with people. But, you know, that's one of the things, as everyone's been saying, we, we realise that, that there is, there's limitations on that and there's limitations for access for people living uh, regionally in South Australia as well as, um, as you know, around the world. But I think that it also, I'm thinking positively because I feel that it's going to open up different, different ways for people to be able to experience the works of art within the Art Gallery of South Australia. So this year is a, a focus year here at the gallery and so I feel like maybe, you know, for the first time, we're going to have a platform that people from all around the world are going to be able to experience the works of art. And if we are clever and we think about innovative ways to have the artist's voices included as part of that um, experience, then, you know, that, that would be the best outcome for everyone, I think. Um, so, yeah, just thinking, you know, quite locally for me about what I'm, actually doing here in Adelaide you know I think um, we're just working towards trying to present you know a, a good experience for the artists and for um, our audiences. I think that thanks Nikki and I and I you know 90 minutes just isn't enough time and I know that um, you know we have a post uh, zoom meeting where we don't get to be recorded and get to have some uh, laughs um, so um, I do want to say thank you Chimigwich Marcy for everybody coming out and I know that everybody's busy and their schedules are a bit crazy and people are tired of Zoom and so I just want to say how much I really appreciate that um, from everybody and it's so nice to hear everybody's voices and all their different uh, nuances and so um, and thanks to everybody for joining us we're definitely going to be posting the talk after on various um, websites of all, everybody's institutions and uh, there will definitely be a publication coming out of Australia that will feed into both New Zealand and Australia. And um, yeah, and ARP Press, they definitely are happy to take your money and buy some more books. So I just feel like uh, really fortunate to get to see everybody and have a dialogue. We had probably about two or three other questions that we just didn't get to. And I hope everybody had a great time. And um, thank you. Bye. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Me. Emma. Thank you. Thanks. See ya. Bye.
Love you guys. See you guys. Love you all. <laughs> Lots of love.